On today's show, the Cleveland Cavaliers cost themselves in Chicago with rebounding issues and three-point issues and blowing a game that was well within their grasp. We're going to talk about that with Jackson Flickinger on today's Locked On Cavs. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Grammarly. Make a bigger impact at work with Grammarly. Sign up for free at Grammarly.com backslash podcast. I'm Chris Manning. That is Jackson Flickinger, who we have here today from Right the Nuclid and Fear the Sword. Check his work out there and check out the Junkyard Dog podcast with him and Tony Pesta as well. Cavs lose to the Bulls a day after Max Struess. Did what he did. The Cleveland Cavaliers was a double overtime game to the Chicago Bulls. And Jackson, I think there's the the place to start is that I think this was a winnable game. This was not a game where the Cavs should have really lost, I think. If they play 5 to 10% better, they probably win this game in the first overtime or in regulation. Or if it even goes to second overtime, I think they could have just won it. This wasn't a particularly good Mitchell game. This wasn't, uh, I think, a particularly impactful game in a couple different angles but I think Cleveland should have won this game quite frankly uh yeah they should have and I had a lot online people saying well they won an improbable game the day before this is just the universe making up for it and really what happened on Tuesday was the Cavs threw away a game that they should have won easily they were up one with the ball with nine seconds left they had the ball after a timeout and they couldn't get the ball in. That's why they were, that's why they needed Max Trees to save them. Today, they were up two in the same spot and they, they did get the ball. And this time, Mitchell misses a free throw and then Jared Allen fouls on a three point shot. And he wasn't even trying to foul. Like it wasn't a, we are up three, so we're going to foul. It was a, I'm going to contest this shot and I fouled, which I think is, is somehow worse. So this was just a really bad wit, really bad loss. And when you, at the end of the season, when you look back and if the Cavs are just barely miss out on a higher seed by one game, this is one of those games that you're going to say, well, they had this game against a bad team and they just threw it away. To the Bulls' credit, they do play Cleveland well, and they even even with all the injuries they have with Lonzo Ball and Patrick Williams and whatnot on the and Alex Caruso doesn't play in this game. I think most notably, they have a bunch of guys who are solid, but they're not great. Talent wise, Cleveland just should be better. I think that's absolutely the case. We're gonna talk about the rebounding part of this in segment two and kind of get big picture on that because that if you want to look at one category that really explains some of what didn't work here. I think you can make a case that it's rebounding and execution as a whole, and that's a big facet of the game. But Jackson, I just didn't think the execution was good in this game. Mitchell is, and I I think Mitchell is at a crux of that. I think number one, he's 5 of 13, not efficient on on twos in particular. He's 4 of 9 from three, so he makes one shot inside the arc. That's just not really good enough, frankly. His output, I don't think, was, was high enough. The fact that he took 13 shots and Mobley took 17 and you know, Garland takes 22 and Levert takes 12. Like Mitchell needs to have a higher sh- on the best nights for Cleveland. He's taking more shots than that and is just more impactful as a score. Secondly, he just made some mistakes that he don't that I normally he does not make. After he hits that big three, um, I think in the fourth quarter, he then has an airballed three when he tries to as a heat check, and then he commits a, tur- a pretty sloppy turnover, making a pass in the middle of the lane. You just mm-hmm. maybe win this game if Mitchell's five percent of the guy that he normally is and off nights happen. You can't like it. Every guy has them. Every, every great player has them. But in this particular game, Mitchell not being great, absolutely cost Cleveland a win. I think it did. And one of the things that I think insulates Mitchell from these really bad games is that even when he's playing bad, he's aggressive and he's still attacking the paint and he's still making defense move. And I felt today he was passive 
I think it seemed like he was trying to let Garland kind of find his footing, but in doing so, he sort of didn't really do much. Maybe it's maybe this is tired legs. He's somebody who was getting over a sickness. As someone who is still getting over a sickness myself, I know that you don't have the energy that you normally do, so maybe that's it. But either way, the Cavs aren't going to, you know, they're not going to win any games handedly when you have a what I would call a passive Mitchell and that's just not the type of player Mitchell is Mitchell is somebody who's always attacking always getting downhill and even the pull up threes that he takes he usually isn't settling but today it felt like a lot of those were settling and obviously that missed free throw if he makes that free throw the Jared Allen you know foul doesn't matter none of this matters we're talking about something completely different what did you make of Garland's performance? He was 44 minutes and two overtimes, 8 of 22 from the field, 7 of 14 from three, five assists, just weren't turnover. Um, was a hat for what single game plus minus is worth. He was a positive, whereas Mitchell was a negative four. 23 points for Garland. What did you make of DG's performance in this one? I think this was a better performance, especially in the three-point volume. One of the things that he took 13 threes, I know this was a double overtime game, but 13 threes is good, but it seemed like he could have taken 14. 14. You're, you're short. You're short changing him. He's I know he's no Sam Merrill Jackson, but 14, not 13. Oh, oh the, the little box, uh, the game book, it, it, it didn't update. So, yes, 14 threes. We got that now. Um, but I feel like he passed up on four or five additional threes that he could have taken. He had that one possession where he had two pretty clean looks at three and he just passed out of them, which one of the things that I think is really interesting when you watch Garland is that he's so like shifty on ball and off ball, especially at the top of the perimeter where he can generate so many three point looks that other guys simply can't, but he needs to take them. So one day he will figure out that, To be the best version of himself, he's going to have to take those shots that are a little not super clean. But today, I think, was a step in the right direction from that standpoint. I still, you know, I think it's a problem that you got an assertive Garland game. And we're also saying, hey, Mitchell was just kind of standing in the background and felt like a secondary piece. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of like the push and pull that seems to always be there that doesn't seem to be there. Like yesterday we were watching Luca and Kyrie and there was no push and pull. They were both pulling at the same time and they're both high usage players who demand the ball constantly and they were equally pulling. Whereas anytime Garland and Mitchell are on the court together, it feels like one guy's pulling and the other guy's watching to allow the other guy to pull. And that's, that's the problem. And that's something that I know that Donovan is touchy about this. And I understand why, because I think it's annoying. I think it'd be annoying to be asked this question constantly that you also ask yourself and don't have an answer for, but this pairing ultimately, and this current construction of this team won't work until they find a way to get this going together at the same time. And I think like even even more than the rebounding, this is what will ultimately hold this team back is that their two best players can't play aggressive basketball together at the same time. And if they can't do that, then they will never reach their ceiling. Yeah, and look, Garland in one possession this game, Tony uh, Pesta did a, I had a good clip of this on, on X. He passed up two threes that he just has to take. Mm-hmm. Garland has to just take those shots, and that's another thing that that contributes here. So that that I think you will look at this game. I think if you're Cleveland and rightfully feel frustrated. All right, after this, how the game was lost was on the glass. Andre Drummond had 25 rebounds, and the Cavs were absolutely wrecked on the glass. We'll talk about that after this. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors. Right now, 
Our partners, EB Motors, have teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each and every week, all season long. Whether you're prepping for a daily draft or scouting your waiver wires, every week we're going to provide you with players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So let's see who Josh just picked out for us on this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Pick of the Week. One name I like for him on here, it's not a team that is performing well right now, but Dennis Schroeder will have an opportunity. Josh writes with Ben Simmons coming off the bench and the Nets having an all-important five games next week. Schroeder has short-term appeal. The Nets' offense right now is it's about as bad as anyone in the league. Go look at the numbers, but maybe there's some value there in Schroeder. Josh knows this stuff, so if he has it, I'm sure it's a good call. Josh Lloyd from Locked On Fantasy Basketball is going to help you win your fantasy championship. And eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. For me, that's my Ford Bronco Sport. I have my eBay Motors account set up for that car. I will be buying parts from that in the future for sure. With over 122 million parts for number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof racks, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you are burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, and exclusions apply. The rebounding Jackson was, frankly, I think the most embarrassing part of this game for Cleveland. To give up 26 rebounds, I said 25, and then ended up being 26 rebounds to Andre Drummond. The fact that you were out rebound, you gave up 74 rebounds as a team, and you had 39. You had just walloped on the glass, gave up. What felt like a bajillion second chance points, ultimately it's 32 for Chicago, a new season high for them, and you only got 11. We, we had this with this team in the playoffs last year, but that, that just cannot happen, frankly. Like for this team, you're playing two bigs a lot. This cannot be a thing, and that, that's the, the scariest part of this game, I think, for the Cavs. Yeah, and... I hate when people talk about rebounding and they just say these guys were out muscled or these guys were out. These guys were tougher than the other guys. It seems like the way that some people talk about like the running game in football, like you just got to like want it more to get those three extra yards. And it's like, that's not really how rebounding works. I don't think there is skill to rebounding, but a lot of times offensive rebounds happen because the defense is out of position. And I think when we talk about that Nick series last year, which I'm sure you've talked about enough, um, a lot of those happened because the Cavs were out of position and that's why Mitchell Robinson was able to dive underneath. And I think you saw that some today. And I think it's really interesting that when Mobley is out there, the team, I feel like Mobley is a, he's a great defender. I don't want to say that he's not a great defender, but I think one of the problems that he has is he, he has a, over willingness to step up and try to contest every single shot because he's he can move and get everywhere on the court seemingly whenever he wants to so he just wants to try to contest those shots and i think every time he does try to contest those shots it allows for a offensive rebound and when you have a team like the bulls who are putting an emphasis on getting second chance points by playing a big lineup you're going to give those up and i think what's really interesting is that on the season, Chris, do you want to guess in what percentile the Cavs are in defensive rebounding when Evan Mobley is off the court? I, he's off I the can't court. imagine. Is it, is it bad? Are you about to give me some bad numbers? No, when Evan Mobley is off the court. So they're good when he's off the court. Pretty good, yeah. You want to, hit me. You want to take a guess? No, I don't want to. No, no, just hit me. 95 percentile when Evan Mobley is off the court. When Evan Mobley is on the court, they are in the 46th percentile. And then when Evan Mobley is on the court and Jared Allen is off the court, they are in the 32nd percentile. So I know that sometimes. Go ahead. I have my theory on that to some degree, and I wonder if sometimes they. Th- I. 
I don't know this to be true. I'd have to like really like go back and watch a lot, I think, to figure this out. Sometimes I would wonder if because they have two bigs, they kind of just assume that the two bigs will take care of these things. And thus, like when you you have that issue with he's in the court, and then when it's Mubi by himself, you're it's like you, none of the other guys you're really playing at the four with him are good rebounders. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about Dean Wade a little bit in segment three. But neither right. him or Niang, whoever it's the four, are strong rebounders. There's a reason why to start the year, Max Struess was crashing the glass very aggressively more than I think he'd ever done in Miami is because I think they wanted another body to mix it up and go get rebounds. They're, they're kind of missing, like, as far as these bench guys. You, it, you Obviously, you were operating within a salary cap and limited assets. But they're missing, like, the, frankly, like, if... They're missing, like, the thing that Kevin Love's superpower remained was that he was still rebounding, and they that has never quite been replaced, and you don't totally 100% need that, but it's, like, a nice thing to have if you're going to have these Mobley issues, and he maybe isn't always near... I don't... Because he's just not always near the rim, and I think that's got to be a part of this, too, if you were look at the tracking data and get to see, which we don't have a public access to, unfortunately. Well, one of the things that I think when you talk about Jared Allen and Evan Mobley, they're both shot blockers. That's what... They're, they're rim protectors. That's what they naturally do. That's what they've done throughout their entire time playing basketball. It's their natural instinct. When they see someone drive, they will always step up. They will always contest the shot. They will always make that tough. When you have people who play the four naturally, that's not their... I mean, yes, they rotate over because they're basketball players, but they're not like... Kevin Love's not like, hey, I'm going to block this shot. Someone like Tristan Thompson, who's a great rebounder, He's not a rim protector. That's something that I think we talked about a lot when he was the starting center on this team when the Cavs were really good, is that's not really what he naturally does. He came up as a four, and he's somebody who's always trying to find space, trying to create space underneath the rim to get those rebounds. And when you have Allen and Mobley, especially Mobley, he just doesn't do that. That's not how he is naturally programmed to operate. So if you get a team that really tries to expose that weakness, they're going to do it because this doesn't show up every single night. If you're going against the team that isn't trying to expose this, they're not going to, it's going to be just fine. But when you have a team like the Knicks that had two bigs that were trying to crash the offensive glass and you have a team like the Bulls who did the same thing, they're going to be able to do this whenever they want. Do you, do you big picture worry about this Compared to some of the other issues the Cavs have, I gonna, do. You, is is this high in your list? I do, depending on the matchup. So, like, if the Cavs played the Pacers in the first round, I'm not going to be laying awake at night thinking about the Pacers crashing the glass. But a team like the Magic, I think that's like, oh yeah, that's a problem. A team like, like, I wouldn't call the Heat a big team, but I would say Eric Spolstra. He probably knows this after watching the Cavs for ten seconds. That's something that he could expose. So I think that depending on the matchup, it could be really bad. And I'm, I, my concern is that we know this. Everybody at Media Day, they were just talking about what did you guys do to get tougher? You know, Kobe had to answer questions about that. JB had to answer questions about that. Jared had to answer questions about that. Everybody had to talk about the toughness and the rebounding. And I think a lot of those conversations came back to we need to get tougher. We need to put on weight. And yes, that would be helpful. But I don't think weight and toughness was ever the issue. I think it's just they weren't in the positions to grab them. And that's what I felt the issue was tonight. So, yes, I'm concerned because it doesn't feel like that particular issue was ever addressed properly. I think it is. I think when you're building a team, I get what you're saying about not being addressed properly. I think the ultimate thing, what they, I think, decided, and I can understand, and I kind of understand how they got there. I largely agree with it, I think. They had to decide, okay, we need it. What do we need and what can we get within our budget? If you're going to say rebounding because it's sort of matchup dependent, we can sacrifice that a little bit to get shooting, to have Dean Wade to be a defender, like whatever it is, you're going to bait. Like, I kind of understand if that's the thing you decide you don't totally want, and then you just, like, hope your backup center, if you need one, can kind of maybe solve those issues. That was really the, the beauty of Tristan Thompson, I think, before the, the steroid suspension. 
Um, Damian Jones is obviously just like in the shadow realm and like you're never going to, he's never going to matter on this team. So maybe Tristan gets run when, when he comes back. But I think they just, I think they made a choice to upgrade other spots and rebounding is just the thing that they couldn't really also address. And I, I do understand why that's where we ended up here, Jackson. And one thing I, I do want to say is that this really comes back in a game where the Cavs played good defense. They held the Bulls to a 46.3 effective field goal percentage. That's elite. You know, they still they still played a good defensive game. A 113.2 defensive rating is probably going to do it most nights. So even though they got absolutely murdered on the glass, the defense was still good enough to win. So I guess if you want to make the bet, all right, like we're going to give up something on the offensive glass, but we're still going to be a good enough team to be a good defensive team still, then I think that's fine. But the problem is the offense has been pretty poor uh, since Darius Garland returned. And I think we kind of talked about that a little bit where you're not getting the most out of Garland and Mitchell. And if you're going to play two smaller guys in the backcourt, it's going to mean that your front court is going to have to step up a lot more and rotate more to protect the rim, which just kind of adds on to that problem. So that's where it feels like if what you're doing, like if the offense can make up for it, then this isn't an issue. You know, like if they had a decent offensive game, we're like, yeah, the Bulls got a ton of rebounds, but they couldn't make any shots because they were playing two bigs. Like, why were they doing that? But on in a disaster case like this, then it's going to be a big issue. All right. After this, we'll get into two positives from this game. Dean Wade and Evan Mobley as an offensive hub. That's coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Grammarly. That is today's title sponsor. No matter what kind of work you do, how you communicate is key. All those emails, reports, and presentations are equally important to the collaboration needed to get the most things done, and Grammarly can help. The thing I love about Grammarly is just the quick automatic spell check it does and checking all your grammars you're doing it. I run it on our podcast notes before we get going. I do it for some work emails. It's super, super helpful. 96% of Grammarly users report that Grammarly helps them craft more impactful writing. Grammarly works across 500,000 apps and websites. And by understanding your writing and context, Grammarly provides relevant personalized suggestions. Save time with one click and go from editing drafts in hours to seconds. 93% of professionals using Grammarly Premium report that it helps them get more work done as well. Grammarly is the gold standard of responsible AI with 14 years of experience and just about every IT certification under the sun. Grammarly is a secure AI writing partner that helps your team make their point and move faster. Make a bigger impact at work with Grammarly. Sign up today and download for free at Grammarly.com backslash podcast. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash podcast. Easier said, done. All right, back here on the Lockdown Cast podcast. Evan Mobley Jackson, I think, amid a loss, was frankly the most impressive Cavalier to me. A much better offensive performance from him coming off of a, a so so offensive game the other night. I thought he just looked good. He looked fluid. I love the way they're featuring him right now. 11 of 17 from the field. Love that he also took four threes, including one late as well. This is the, the structure of Evan Mobley that I want to see, even if it doesn't totally work out to its maximum because he misses four free throws and he misses three of his four threes. He was good on defense. He did make a lot of shots inside the paint and and pretty effectively do it. Got to the line a good amount of times. I just like the performance overall, and, and I think it bodes well for where he continues to be at. Yeah, I think that we've seen a good version of Evan Mobley on the on the offensive side of the ball since he returned from Injury, I know yesterday wasn't great, but this was a really good performance. I was going to bring up that I really liked how confidently he took those threes late. Um, If you're going to play Jared Allen and Evan Mobley late in games, they're going to be open. So 
Like those are shots that he's going to have to get comfortable taking. And I'd rather him try to get comfortable taking those shots in a February game in Chicago than having to wait until April in a playoff game and try to take those shots then. So I think that is really good. And yeah, I definitely agree. This was just a really solid showing. Dean Wade's the other, I think, standout from this game. No George Nyang in the second half of this game. Nyang just wasn't making shots, and I think they went away from Wade, who, look, Dean Wade to still, still two shots isn't enough. Um, it's just not for him. And they, they also, this, this, was, this wasn't so much about Dean Wade as I think it was about they lean into Levert for heavy minutes and Struess and playing a little more spaced out and none of their kind of four options. But Dean Wade got second half minutes. Niang didn't. And Wade, I think, did a really good job defensively on DeMar DeRozan. I, I've done a complete 180 on Dean Wade. I know two shots, that usage is really low. Like He's got it. He, he, he's got to shoot. Like that's, that's the whole problem, I think. That's, that's where the hesitation comes. But I really think we're, we are underselling how good he is defensively in how we always say this guy's a really good team defender and it's kind of like code for they're not really that good of a defender on ball you don't really notice them but like yeah they're always in the right spot but really Dean Wade is a really good team defender he's always he's in the rotation or like he makes the rotation before he kind of needs to make the rotation in the sense that like he's always He's always there in the spot that he needs to be. He's never not there. He, I, you said earlier that he's not a good rebounder. I, I kind of push back on that. I think Wade is a decent rebounder. I don't think he's he's not like a great yeah, rebounder. He's fine. But, yeah, but when, when you're I talking say not about, good, he's fine. He's just he's, when you when you like compare him to like Niang, who I think is a bad rebounder. When we talk about those lineups with Mobley that aren't getting rebounds, I think. The data I don't, I don't have to hold up, but when Mobley and Wade are out there, they get a lot more rebounds than they do with than they do with Mobley and uh, Niang. So if I was hell bent on keeping um, Niang in the, in the rotation, which I'm I'm personally not, but I think some other people are, I would try to pair Niang's minutes with Allen and try to get Wade out there with Mobley when he's alone, because I think it just it makes a lot more sense from a rebounding perspective. And like that's I think that's one of the main issues with some of those second unit lineups that uh Mobley is running with. The mixing and matching of lineups on the stretch is one of the most important parts of this season. It's gonna be fascinating. So that's Cavs Bulls. Jackson, we couldn't have you on without asking you one Cleveland charge question. And that's that Sharif Cooper has not attended deal with the team. We haven't covered it yet on the show. Cowards. Cooper, <laughs> just waiting for you, buddy. Thank you. No problem. We're, we're peace over here. Cooper to me, Jackson, I, I really, there's parts of his game I really like because he can fill it up. He's really athletic. There's a reason he was at one point like a high, he was mocked much higher than he ended up going in the second round. He's just not going to play in this 10-day because it's like they don't need him. And I, I, I will – when the Cavs sign Craig Porter Jr. to a multi-year contract and they don't go out of their way to like give Porter on addition for the backup point guard job, that tells you, I think, where they kind of see him in the hierarchy aside from all the positives they could say. I, li- I, feel, I like that he's getting this call-up. I think he's earned it. I, it just feels like the path for him, if it's going to be in the NBA, it's maybe not here beyond this season, even though he's been a really good – charge player and, and really important to that team's success. One one thing I will say as somebody who has now covered the charge for three years, the more G League basketball you watch, thank you, thank you. The more you understand that a lot of the things that are keeping these guys from making the next level aren't skill related. It's usually more so fit and like understanding of roles related because a lot of times what gets you to the professional looking like those skills, those aren't the skills that are going to take you to the next step in the professional game. 
no matter if we're talking about somebody like Darius Garland or even if we're talking about somebody like Sharif Cooper, who has obviously less skills than Darius Garland, um, you have to kind of learn how to play in the professional game, how to best use what you do best and how to and how that fits into an NBA ecosystem. And I think it's easy to say Sharif Cooper six one, like he doesn't like he's never going to fit. And I think I think he could fit, but for him to fit, he needs to apply his skills better as a backup point guard in in the sense that he needs to come out more aggressive. He needs to be taking more threes. He needs to be less careless with the ball when he does come out. Because when you look at somebody who's going to be playing, if in an ideal situation for Cooper, he'd be playing 15 minutes a game. How can you make an impact in 15 minutes as opposed to somebody who comes in and carries the scoring load. So I think it's, I believe that, and that Cooper can be an NBA player, but I think he needs to sort of figure out how he would fit into an NBA ecosystem and how to best use the skills that he has to be that, that guy, which I don't think he's done yet, but just cause he hasn't done it yet. Doesn't mean he can't in the future. We talk about somebody like Sam Merrill, Sam Merrill, is 27 years old. He is a great movement shooter who found his role in the G League. But if you look at him and if you went back and watched him in college, that's that's not the guy he was in college, at least not a direct cor- a direct correlation. So guys like some guys find their roles a little later in their careers than other guys. Cooper may be somebody who three, four years down the road he could be impactful. Or he could be somebody who is playing over in Europe because he can't figure out how to best adapt his game to the NBA game. Yeah, and I think, too, he's just also in this bottleneck now where, unfortunately, like, you you exceed at the charge level, but it doesn't... It's not like Major League Baseball's minor league right. system where, like, you're great in AAA and thus you are going to get a bat to the Major League level or get to pitch at a Major mm-hmm. League level. Here, it's, hey, you're on a 10-day. You're going to, like, get a better paycheck, which is good for you, but then you're not going to play because that's not why. We have you here to be depth and a body and, I think, reward him to some degree. Like, that's what it feels like to me. And that, there's nothing wrong with that, but the NBA, the NBA is not, like, built necessarily to promote young guys like this and give them a chance to fail. Like, there's just not enough minutes. There's not enough teams. So, I'm right. glad he's up here. It's a cool story. He's really talented, um, but it might. I don't know if this is... The, the, the situation it's, for him is it's not like he's with the Hornets who just like need a body or something. Right. This would be if we talked about the 2021 Cavs, he'd be a good person to stick into that system where you were running uh, Brandon Knight out there. Sorry, Brandon Goodwin out uh, there trying to get trying to get minutes from him, trying to get minutes from Rajon Rondo. Like, yeah, Sharif Cooper would definitely he's somebody who could dribble. He's somebody who can attack the paint. He's somebody who can put pressure on the defense. That's something that they need. Obviously, this team already has enough undersized guys. They can't even find minutes for Sam Merrill, who may be, you know, maybe maybe the best shooter in the league, not named Steph Curry. Uh, I would find minutes. I think he would have been... I think Sam Merrill... I think those minutes with... God, you're so- <laughs> with Mitchell and Garland, like, what? like, what is... Okay, if you're going to go... <laughs> If you're gonna go small, you so much. It, if you're gonna go small with one big, what's the point of Karis LeVert out there with Garland and Mitchell? I see the point yeah, the of answer, Karis LeVert. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I see the point of Karis LeVert in a lineup that, that has two bigs because you need as much ball handling as possible. But if you're gonna go with just one big and Roos. I think that's where you got to go with Sam Merrill to create some movement instead of Karis LeVert just standing there, Darius just standing there, Donovan trying to make things happen. You know, anyways, I just had to sneak that in before before you I, said I, that's I, it. I love, the, I, I love that you did it. I think you're correct. So there, you can, you can, you can rest easy. This is, that this is like, that. this I, is like, this is like a teacher saying like, I agree with you because I don't really want to talk about this. No, I've That's, no. Hey, well, yes, we're at the end of the show, but also I have been Merrill. I will just readily admit I am Sam Merrill pilled, and I think about like how they could use him a lot and the three point volume of late. I, there's a story you could tell about how they're missing him and and what he could do and what and what 
a different lens would tell you about what they could use from it. We're going to end there. Jackson would be not all three point trying. shots are created equally. So even though they got some shots up today, Sam Merrill would have created different opportunities for everybody else. Goodbye. That's that's right. All right. That is for Lockdown Cassidy. Jackson will be back in the future, I'm sure. I want to remind you that you can check out the Locked On Sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports City is here for you 24-7, covering the top stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Locked On Cavs was on there yesterday. If you saw it, hope you did. We'll be back. Evan will be back tomorrow with the Locked On Knicks guys talking about Sunday's game. And I may or may not have some Cavs Pistons thoughts for you Friday night after that game if something interesting happens there. Because just drop it on YouTube and why not? I'm watching anyway. So we'll talk to you then. Thanks again to Jackson. Thanks again to Jake Stevens. Have a great day.